the Sanctuary for Independent Media. For those of you who do not know us, we are an organization here in North Central Troy, one of the most environmentally challenged and economically oppressed communities in New York State. For 15 years, we've built an environmental education campus, transforming abandoned buildings and lots on one block into infrastructure for DIY people power using community media, community radio, and community science to activate and build networks. We have a long tradition of presenting filmmakers who use media for social and environmental justice. And that leads us to today, our second event in the North Troy Environmental Justice Film Festival. We welcome the, the panelists, the filmmakers, we welcome you as an audience as we continue the theme, investigating the power of local media makers and local voices engaged in struggling against environmental challenges in their community, communities. Our mission at the sanctuary is that we use art, science and participatory action to promote social and environmental justice and freedom of creative expression. And before we be begin this event, we would like to make an acknowledgement of the land we are on. It is with gratitude and humility that we acknowledge that the Sanctuary for Independent Media resides upon and broadcasts the Hudson Mohawk Magazine radio show from and does our Zoom calls from the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people who are indigenous peoples of the lands of New York. Despite tremendous hardships and being forced from their lands, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. And I'd like to introduce uh, the co-creator and my um, co-curator and my colleague, Professor Kathy High. Thank you so much, Branda. And thank you everybody for being here, especially our panelists. We're really grateful to have them on board for this wonderful event. Um, and I also wanna just uh, thank the IEAR Presents series, which is one of our collaborators and co-sponsors for this event. So this event is co-sponsored by IEAR Presents and the School of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences at Rensselaer University. And it is also made possible by the New York State Council on the Arts with support of Governor Andrew M. Cuomo and the New York State Legislature. So on top of that, I'd like to acknowledge the Sanctuary's project Nature Lab. And Nature Lab is our new environmental education center. And we're looking at environmental, um, urban environmental and social justice with this project. Um, we also have been working with uh, two different ongoing um, projects at Nature Lab. One is with Riverkeeper, it's called Water Justice Lab. And this is a project that's testing the waters of the Hudson River. The Hudson River is just adjacent to the sanctuary and the Nature Lab location. And then also with RPI and the National Science Foundation support, um, we're working with our soil project, which we'll be talking about today where we're looking at urban soils and the residual toxins from past and, and present industry. Um, so Abby and Sebastian will be speaking about this project in a moment. So we're really honored to have this special discussion today along with the North, a Northern Hemisphere sneak preview of this really amazing documentary, Eureka. Uh, we hope that you as viewers will have already been able to screen the film if not, the directors have selected excerpts with you uh, for you to share today. And when they play the excerpts, if you could turn your video off, that might help us with the quality of our Zoom call. Also, you have a window to screen the full film until midnight tonight. And so we'd like to welcome our panelists. Um, so first of all, the Arika directors include um, Lars Edman and William Johansson Kalin. And maybe you can just wave to introduce yourselves. Um, then we have the Our Soil team um, the, with project leader, uh, Professor Abby Kinchy 
and also the Nuestro Suelos uh, leader, Professor Sebastian Urita from Chile. And as well, we have invited activist and Professor Rodrigo Pino, who's also here from Chile today. And finally, and thanks to our translator, Professor da Daniel Mosquera. Um, so first, we're gonna turn to the filmmakers and the Arica activists. So um, I'd love to ask you all to um, please introduce yourselves, Lars, William, and Rodrigo, uh, just a few minutes uh, for each and then share how you came to be involved with this film. Maybe we should start with uh, William, yeah. I, I can start. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting us for this. And uh, thank you for everybody who has joined us. Um, we started with this film. Uh, I mean, we, we have been following this for more than 15 years now. And uh, this is the second film we're doing on, on the subject. We, me and Lars, we were studying film in, in, uh, in Arica, no, in, in Valparaiso, uh, in Chile, uh, when we first heard about this toxic waste and that it came from our hometown. Uh, because uh, uh, for those of you who have seen the film, you, you already know that Lars is from, uh, uh, from the, the same place as this toxic waste. Uh, that goes as well for me. I'm also from there. So when we heard that uh, the, the biggest, the most important company from our home had polluted thousands of people on the other side of, of, of the planet. Uh, I mean, for, for us, Boliden, the company ha has meant uh, uh, economical prosperity. And, you know, it's paid for all the good stuff that we've had in our society. Uh, so, so it we very. I mean, it, it was very obvious for us that we had to to tell this story. Uh, so then we did the first film, and then, yeah, I, I can leave to to Lars to continue the, <laughs> the story. Thank you, Lars. You're muted. There you go. So my name is Lars Edman, uh, the co-director of this film and also uh, one of the protagonists in the film, as you might know already if you've seen it. Um, like William said, this has been a long going project for us, uh, 15 years and counting. And um, we uh, uh, making Toxic Playground, the first film was really about just letting people know about what actually happened in, uh, in Chile, in Narica. Um, and having the opportunity to follow this up with the second film is, uh, of course, fantastic and a documentary filmmaker's dream. Uh, we were presented with the opportunity a couple of years after Toxic Playground first premiered, when we had a call from, uh, from Gordon Lewis, an US environmental lawyer, who told us that they were looking into the possibility of, of, uh, of going uh, to try, uh, take bullion to try uh, for the actions uh, in Arica. Um, yeah, so um, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Um, for those who have seen the film, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope that you who still haven't will, will see it and uh, hopefully value it. Thank you, Lars. Um, and Rodrigo, maybe how did you become involved in the in the film and and working with these guys? Rodrigo está silenciado. Tienes que prender el micrófono. Ay, ay, ay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Hola. Eh, mi nombre es eh, Rodrigo Pino uh, Vargas. De profesión soy antropólogo. Y en, en los últimos años me, me han conocido como, o me han presentado como activista. Está bien, antropólogo, activista, activista, suena bien. Eh, llevo desde el año 2005 acá en Arica, eh, trabajando eh, en el tema de contaminación. Si bien partió por, una, por un interés académico, era un par de años, ¿cierto? de un trabajo 
en que quería conocer y comprender eh, las problemáticas de la comunidad que en ese tiempo se le, se le conocía, eh, ¿cómo le decía? Los, la contaminación por plomo, era, era muy específico, muy por plomo. Entonces, eh, y bueno, desde ese año del 2005, que, que después esto me atrapó y me quedé a Canarica, si bien yo soy de Narica, pero estaba viviendo mucho tiempo fuera, en el 2005 regresé a Arica, y bueno, son más de 16 años vinculado a, a esta problemática, por tanto, puedo decir que, que conozco, digamos, lo suficiente para poder comprender eh, la, la gran complejidad del tema, y en ese, eh, en eso, en ese devenir, eh, conocí a Lors, a Williams, en el 2005. Ellos hicieron un primer documental, en el 2005, después en eh, el 2009, Toxic Playground, y en esas conversaciones y diálogos, eh, siempre pensábamos que, que nuestro trabajo debe, debería ir mucho más allá, profundizar más. Ahora, tampoco nunca, eh, nunca nos imaginamos, por lo menos yo no me Nunca imaginé eh, hasta dónde podíamos llegar. Entonces, eh, yo diría que en ese caso la película Arica, ¿cierto? Eh, retrata muy bien, refleja muy bien, ¿cierto? Esta, esta problemática, donde hay, básicamente uno identifica que hay una violación a los derechos humanos de esta comunidad, ¿cierto? que han transitado por decisiones políticas o en tribunales, en Chile, en Suecia. Así que creo que hay, hay hartos temas ciertos que están dando vuelta y que hoy día la comunidad requiere que se puedan resolver porque diríamos que es una comunidad que ha estado enfrentada por más de, más de 25 años, a, a más, mucho más, yo diría 30 años. A esta, a esta situación. Entonces, creo que eh, en resumen uno podría decir que es una comunidad, ¿cierto? Que, que se han violado sus derechos humanos, derecho a la vida, derecho a la salud, derecho a la información, eso es, es algo elemental, ¿cierto? Que tampoco no se conversa mucho. Eh, es un tema donde en, en tribunales chilenos y suecos ¿cierto? no se ha accedido a la justicia, ha habido una denegación de justicia. Entonces, creo que el, el trabajo, eh, sobre todo realizado por, por la productora Laika Phil, con Andreas, con Lors, William, ¿cierto? y también hace un par de años eh, unos amigos ingleses, yo diría que ha sido un trabajo, eh, con, diríamos, con mucha pasión, uh, con mucho entusiasmo, uh, y eso no, nos tiene hoy día en, esta, en este punto. ¿ya? Eh, la gente de Arica cuando vio la película eh, se sintió muy, muy, muy representada, eh, con mucho dolor, ¿cierto? Eh, recordando momentos duros, duros, donde... Esta comunidad es, es fácil entrar y conversar con la gente y, y poder identificar y captar que hay mucho sufrimiento por las enfermedades y, y por las muertes. Generalmente, yo no digo a diario, pero es, es muy común ¿cierto? Que, que estén falleciendo personas por causa de, digamos, de enfermedades como el cáncer, por ejemplo. Eso es un tema que hoy día... Eh, ya no está en discusión, hace años sí estaba en discusión, pero hoy día es, es una realidad. Por tanto, no me quiero alargar, pero yo diría como presentación que estamos eh, conectados, vinculados, ¿cierto?, a, a un tema de, de mucho sufrimiento y de mucha injusticia. Así que esperamos que, que, en el, que en el correr de los meses y del tiempo podamos ir dándole, ¿cierto?, Alguna, eh, algunas respuestas. Eh, que son muy necesarios para la gente. Eso. Mm. Should I translate? Yes, that'd be good. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm going to try to. Um, 
I'm going to try to compress it uh, a little okay. bit. Um, and my name is Rodrigo Pino Vargas. I'm an anthropologist uh, by training, uh, but in recent years have also been um, associated with the term activist. Um, uh, since 2005, I started working um, in Arica on the topic of uh, environmental pollution and contamination. Uh, but it was initially a, kind of an academic interest um, that then morphed into, into a more um, activist uh, process. Um, uh, initially, uh, you know, since then I got roped into, into this process and it is more than 16 years since um, that I've been involved in, in, in this issue and enough um, to, to kind of understand how complex um, it is. And I met uh, also around that time, Lars and, and the filmmakers and, and in those conversations with them, um, our work uh, kind of grew um, uh, in a different direction as we um, uh, felt that it needed to go beyond the film, that there needed to be an activism uh, that was of, of a political nature. Um, and, and that's why the film kind of reflects um, uh, so many of these challenges um, that have to do with the violation of human rights um, uh, that oftentimes are mediated, these violations are mediated by legal bodies, both in Chile and Sweden, uh, uh, leaving the communities that are uh, victimized um, uh, marginal uh, to these uh, realities. And so a lot of these topics are important to these communities and, um, and, and those communities would like to see those um, uh, challenges resolved. Uh, in summary, uh, uh, this is really about a community whose rights to life, rights to uh, 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 just environments and rights to information uh, have been violated by, by all, both uh, justice uh, systems and, and so this process has kind of been growing, including uh, other people in trying to find adequate solutions. When Americans uh, saw the film, they felt uh, represented, but they also felt that there was a lot of pain. Um, and and Arican, uh, Arica is, is, is an accessible community that has kind of internalized uh, much of the suffering, but has also uh, sought mechanisms to be an active uh, participant in the solutions. Um, and today, uh, you know, it is common uh, to see many uh, people in the community uh, expressing a lot more concern about cancer and all kinds of different uh, consequences of, of these uh, realities. And so um, I would like to end it there. Thank you. And thank you for that translation. Um, okay, well, I would love to go into some excerpts from the film. Um, in case people have not had a chance to see it, this will give you a little bit of grounding as to what this film offers. It's really an incredibly strong film, so I do encourage you to see it. Um, and I'll let uh, William and, um, and Lars speak to the different sections. There are like uh, five different segments they've chosen. Um, and also, I was interested in asking you to think as filmmakers, and activists, this is for Rodrigo as well, uh, in Arica, how are you thinking about using this film as an environmental organizing tool? You've spoken about this a little bit, but maybe you can continue to expand on that. We would love to hear about that too. So I'll pass it over to William and, um, and guide us as we go into these clips. <laughs> and, may, and you can just tell Steve which clip you wanna show, you know, you're when you're ready and he'll put it up. Okay, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I think the, the order that, that it was in, in his player was, was a, a good one. <laughs> um, so sh should I also put, turn off my video now? Or? Up to you. Oh yeah, we were gonna ask people to please turn off their videos while we play the, the films, just so that the film clips, just so we have you know, more bandwidth going forward. So yeah, will... you can turn yours off, yeah. Okay, so uh, then I think the first uh, clip we're going to see here now is actually with uh, uh, Rodrigo, uh, who you now know. Uh, and this is uh, from the starting of the trial when he is uh, for the first time meeting with the people and, and you know, building the case, getting people involved in the case. Uh, and you will also hear that 
because the court case was about 800 persons, but but this is something that is much, much bigger, that it's thousands of affected uh, in this uh, catastrophe. So please roll the clip. Los pobladores que están involucrados en la demanda es un grupo menor. 800 personas del total de 15.000 o 18.000 personas. Entonces, para ser parte, digamos, de esta nueva, este nuevo grupo, se puede, se puede incorporar más gente, aunque esté presentada la demanda en Suecia. Entonces, si usted tuviera 30, 25 o, o más, la podríamos incorporar. Pero hay que considerar que las toneladas de desechos tóxicos que habían acá había 14 metales pesados, hasta donde yo sé. Y ya se les solicitó la demanda. Estamos peleando con una empresa que es gigante, gigante allá en, en Suecia o en Europa. Tener la posibilidad de demandar a Boliden allá en Suecia, en una corte sueca, eso ya es un éxito. Sin saber todavía esto en qué va a terminar. Yes, and this next clip is uh, uh, from where uh, Boliden uh, got to, to, to know a bit about this for the first time. And Boliden had, had been very quiet before this. Uh, they didn't say more than the absolute necessary <laughs> about uh, uh, what had happened in Arica. But yeah, this was when they first heard about the law case. Hey, Johan Örberg, I'm Söker Eva Rydén. Hej, Johan Öberg. Jag heter Kenneth, advokatbyrå i Stockholm. Hej. Jag har förstått att du är ansvarig jurist i Bolidingkoncernen. Ja. Jag ringer angående de här transporterna av gruvavfall i mitten på 80-talet till Kila. Jag antar att du känner till det. Det är så att jag tillsammans med ett antal kollegor här i Sverige, i Chile och i USA har tittat på det här en, en tid. Och vi har eh, jobbat fram ett utkast till sämningsansökan på Boliden. Cancer, missbildningar, verk i leder och skelett. Det avfall som Boliden skeppade iväg till Chile i mitten av 80-talet fortsätter att orsaka stor... 800 människor i en fattig kokstad i en öken i norra Chile som ställer krav på ett svenskt multinationellt bolag här i Sverige. Nu känns det ju otroligt fint att eh, det är någon som har tagit över stafettpinnen här och eh, gör det på ett sätt som vi som filmare inte eh, kan göra. I fyra års tid har förberedelser och gjorts inför den omfattande rättsprocessen som delvis kommer till efter en uppmärksamma dokumentärfilm. Alltså, som vi har det i reportaget här så vet vi att barn har lekt i ett giftigt avfall med arsenik, bly och kvicksilver som kommer härifrån, eh, från Sverige och från Boliden. Det här hade ju aldrig hänt om avfallet hade stannat kvar i Sverige. Yes, uh, and this next one is when uh, the case has started. This was uh, the biggest case that this uh, court in Sleftia had had ever had, uh, and there were experts coming in from all over the world. Uh, and we, of course, we tried to to come close to, to all these people and uh, uh, especially the, the experts from, from the company side, from Boolean side, but it was not always that easy as you will see now. But you're here uh, 
until tomorrow. Thank you. Have a good time. Jag måste berätta att jag är det för att jag tror att ni kommer att ge en rättvis behandling. Båda sidor tar hjälp av vittnen och sakkunniga från hela världen. Experter på kilensk rätt, meteorologer, toxikologer, markexperter, kemister och metallurger, politiker, före detta anställda och chefer. Arika Sidan har till exempel experter som ska visa att de nivåer av arsenik som finns i de drabbade urin är skadlig och att arseniken verkligen kommer från just bolidens avfall. I am a professor at Chapman University in California. In my expert opinion, the smelter sludge is a clear and significant source of arsenic in the area. To discount it as a source of arsenic takes a tremendous stretch of uh, imagination. When I first heard from one of the lawyers that the bullet in waste had 17% arsenic, I didn't believe it. I've never heard anything like that. A pile of waste that close to a city with that high of arsenic concentration. Uh, okay, and in this uh, next one, uh, I mean, uh, as a filmmaker, uh, you're used to follow a process and, uh, but I mean, this has sort of become really part of our lives and uh, a very special thing in making this movie when we were following this court case was that uh, uh, one of us, Lars, was even called as a witness. So now we will see Lars when he is a witness in the case. Då, Lars, eh, när ni var där och eh, gjorde den här filmen, vad fick ni för intryck av hälsoläget? i området kring CTOF? Allmänt sett så finns det väldigt många människor som är sjuka i området. Det, det är liksom det intrycket man får när man kommer ut, utanför centrala delarna och ut mot det här området nära CTOF. Att där är det i var och varannan familj så är det folk som har allvarliga hälsoproblem. Él era mi razón de todo lo que yo estaba haciendo. Y me lo quitaron. And uh, in this uh, final clip, we'll meet uh, some of the. Uh, you're, you're breaking, your audio survivors, is breaking up. Uh, and uh, here. Uh, no, I'm sorry to interrupt, but could you start again? Because your audio is breaking up. It might just be for me. I'm not sure, but. Okay. Thanks. So in this uh, last clip, we will meet some of the survivors and get their view. Of, on uh, uh, responsibility and, and uh, uh, about Bolid and the company who brought this to Arika. Ay, ellos dicen que no. No son culpables. ¿Y a quién le echan la culpa? Eh, sobre todo a Promel. Pro, a Promel. Mm. Ja, pero ¿y quién trajo las sustancias químicas ellos? ¿Cuántos años tenía? Doce. Solo quiero decir... Quiero... que se haga justicia. Mata a mi hijo. 
¿Quién mató a su hijo? Bolide. Ellos mataron los tóxicos sabiendo lo que estaban haciendo. Si la otra parte tiene preguntas, no. Um, so I think that was it for the selections, unless uh, this section is really, this next one is really, really dear. Maybe we should just show this one more because it's an incredibly sweet uh, thing to end on. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thanks, sorry, I'm being sentimental here, but I love it. <laughs> yeah. Le gusta? Sí. De hecho, nosotros a veces le hicimos Lush y dice, mi nombre no es Lush, mi nombre es Lars. ¿Y ustedes qué opinan? ¿En por qué le puse a mi hijo el nombre suyo? Es como un honor tan grande que no sé qué decir, es como... ¡Wow! Yo lo puse porque me gustó la combinación y el nombre es raro. Me sí. gustó el nombre Lars y, y el William. Mm. Entonces como que los junté y porque sonó, oh, Lars William. Fuera. <risa> Eso no se puede saber qué es lo que me espera para el día de mañana. O qué le espera a mi hijo para el día de mañana. Espero que nada. Espero que sigan así, sanito, como está. Me lo estaba grabando. Pero, como te digo, Rica está contaminado ya. Yo no quiero eso para mi hijo. Thank you for that. Um, and I, so if we can maybe return to that film, that question that I had, had posed, thank you for showing those clips. Um, because the, the people who c appear in your film are so comfortable being on camera with, with you all. So I imagine that it's this time commitment that you've put into the project that has made them so. But also, Uh, we can see as we watch the film what an important thing this film is as a kind of organizing tool. And also the fact that, as you said, Loris, that this is the second of you know, these films that you've been making these films for a long time. So if you could just talk about how, what it's like to be using it as, a, as an organizing tool and what that means to you, because you all are obviously really committed to this project. And it's really beautiful to see. Uh, you're muted, Lars. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was saying that, I mean, of course, um, you make this, this kind of film to try to make things change. Uh, in this case, I mean, to try to make the lives of the people of Rika better uh, in some way. And uh, Going back to the first film, Toxic Playground, that also was like one of the goals of that film to show the reality, but also we were hoping for some, some kind of change and some kind of uh, new opportunities maybe for the people in Arica. But what we've learned from that experience in that film, uh, which was quite an, uh, like success in Sweden, it was all over the news, it was, uh, we were it was screened in the Swedish parliament uh, many like uh, the environmental manage, uh, minister uh, from that time went on to, to comment on it so we're really hoping that and maybe seeing that things might actually happen now uh, but then it all kind of died out uh, in the following year and following years 
after this initial debate and discussion. And we hadn't really prepared for how to make the best of the reactions uh, from that film. And, uh, but of course you learn from, learn from experience. So now going into this project, uh, Arika, we've actually begun, I mean, years before the actual premiere of the film to work uh, in different ways, uh, networking uh, through different uh, societies and, and uh, with different players in the field to actually uh, be able to, to, how do you say, capitalize <laughs> maybe uh, from the film. Uh, maybe you, William, can, can fill in a bit. Uh... Yes, exactly. It's been, because I mean, uh, from the first film, there were a lot of people coming to us, but how can we help? What, what, can, what can we do? And, uh, uh, we didn't really have an answer. So this time that had been important for us to canalize all that good energy. Uh, and we have also, I mean, before this, we have had some great opportunities. We, 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 we got to show uh, some of the material uh, at the UN uh, and also the Toxic Playground and having discussions. It was, at that time, it was about, uh, uh, the ban amendment, which is part of the uh, the Basel uh, amendment, who that, that that is supposed to make this kind of exports illegal, with toxic waste from a richer country to a poorer country. But uh, if the receiving countries, or rather if the politicians in that country says that uh, they are fine with it to be sent, then uh, it's still okay. So that means it's. It's, it's not a very good law. Uh, so, so there is this amendment that, that we have been uh, trying to help to push, which has been a, a very good experience. And uh, it, it actually even came into play. So now a couple of the countries that have signed that amendment, then that, that will, <laughs> I mean, uh, it, it, it will become stricter. Uh, and also doing uh, work together with, with Rodrigo, uh, supporting the community in different ways. Uh, we've had this uh, uh, very nice collaboration with uh, 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 something called the Solidarity Pot uh, with uh, during the COVID pandemic. Um, a lot of the people in this area, they are, uh, as if you've seen the film, you know, they, are, they are very poor, they don't have uh, so much money and also the kind of jobs that they get is uh, from day to day. So if you don't work, you won't get any pay. If you don't get any pay, it will be diff difficult to get any food. So then uh, Rodrigo organized uh, uh, and some other people in Arica um, this beautiful project with where, where people could come and uh, uh, get something to eat for you know the cost that it costs to, to make it. And if you make a lot of, of food, the price for every meal will be a lot smaller. It will be cheaper. Uh, so all these kind of different things that you can actually do and step by step, uh, hopefully do have a po positive change. And also trying to now when the film is out, because it is in this timeline of, of like 15 years, it has, it's a very short time that the film has been out. It's just a couple of months. Uh, so now canalizing all, all the, the energy and all the, the, the positive and good intentions that people come with and, and uh, into projects and, and stuff that can benefit uh, the community. Thank you. And, and Rodrigo, I mean, you have obviously been as you said, turned from a, uh, a more academic position into this activist through this process, which is an amazing story. And how has the film in your mind helped this whole process of, of getting attention to this event? 
Uh, Rodrigo, que si podrías responder a, a la pregunta de Cathy sobre cómo el filme ha contribuido a, a, a traer cambio, ¿no? a generar cambio. Uh, y regresando a la pregunta inicial, cómo el, el filme mismo se ha convertido en una herramienta uh, para organizar a las personas, a las comunidades. A ver, la primera pregunta respecto de la posibilidad de, de cómo la película puede ser o es ¿cierto? Una, una herramienta de cambio, si efectivamente hoy día puede ser eso. Um, primero, eh, 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 es muy pronto todavía, ¿cierto? Llevamos poco tiempo donde solamente tuvimos aquí como, como ciudad la posibilidad de ver la película Arica. Entonces, eso es uno. La, no toda la comunidad afectada lo pudo ver, ¿cierto? Teníamos nosotros una planificación diferente con, con Lords, Billian y Andreas, porque queríamos trabajar con la ex exhibición de la película para toda la ciudad, pero también realizar eh, una exhibición eh, por sectores dentro de la, de, la, de la comunidad de polimetales, que nosotros le decimos. Entonces eso por efecto de la pandemia no se pudo eh, realizar esa, esa exhibición, ese trabajo, porque esa era la forma de poder eh, exhibir la película comentar, discutir y escuchar a los, a, eh, a los afectados. ¿Ya? Entonces el, fa el factor COVID, el factor pandemia, eh, no, nos impidió eso. Eso es uno. ¿Ya? Eh, vamos a ver en el momento de los siguientes meses, ¿cierto? Cómo, cómo la película eh, la, la podemos exhibir ¿cierto? en esos territorios. Eso es uno. Después la, con la posibilidad que, o qué posibilidad tiene, ¿cierto? En términos de, 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 de objetivos, ¿cierto? De, de alcanzar eh, objetivos, eh, una película puede, ¿cierto? No, va, va ¿cierto? Es ser una herramienta educativa, se sí, puede ser, ya. Eh, no, es, no es fácil eh, poder tomar una, una, unas palabras exactas sobre eh, qué es o cómo diferenciamos aquello que es educativo y qué es lo que es activismo. En mi caso, ¿cierto? Uh, he trabajado en, en, en muchos proyectos ya con la comunidad en términos de educativos, proyectos educativos. Uh, y... Y uno cómo podría diferenciarlos bien, ¿cierto? Si ese es un acto, digamos, como, como normalmente se le, ha, eh, se, le, se le puede denominar de activismo. ¿ya? Yo entiendo que la propia forma de, de poner un, un tema, un problema dentro de una comunidad, ¿cierto? Eh, hay, hay una mezcla de, de, de educación, de activismo, y, y la película rica. Eh, tiene, tiene un gran mérito. Ese mérito está en que es capaz de recoger un proceso que, no, que se diferencia a muchas otras películas y documentales de las que uno puede ver, ¿cierto? Disponer en diferentes plataformas. Tiene el mérito de tener más de 16 años para reflexionar, mostrar, captar y capturar la vida de, de una comunidad. Entonces, es, ese mérito, ¿cierto? Uno dice, sí, es una película. Ellos eh, pretenden educar, también hay activismo en eso, evidentemente, toman posición. Eh, lo que sí, y que te, también tiene que ver con el mérito de lo que yo hablo, es que eh, yo tengo una posición distinta, y mi posición, ¿cierto? Es que yo estoy dentro de la comunidad y en muchas ocasiones y veces, ¿cierto? Eh, uno no podría ser tan objetivo como lo han pretendido ser el Ars Williams, ¿cierto? Con, con su película. Es un tema, digamos, que 
que, que vemos la, 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 las cosas de manera más, digamos, uno más objetiva que, que la otra. Entonces, ese mérito yo diría que, que, tiene, que, que, que tiene esta película, es capaz de transmitir un proceso, en este caso jurídico, pero es capaz de, de llevar la historia de una comunidad, ¿cierto? Donde ellos... Eh, han sido capaces de, de, de capturar eso. Yo diría que eh, esa, esa sola posibilidad de, de un trabajo de, de tantos años, ¿cierto? Y reducirla a unos 100 minutos, ¿cierto? De una película es, es, un, es tremendo. Eh, yo que llevo igual 15 años vinculado cuando me toca hablar del tema, yo podría pasar horas y horas, entonces eh, poder sintetizar una gran problemática dentro de una película es un mérito, entonces eso de educar, sí, claro, es una posibilidad, pero evidentemente que, que detrás de eso hay un compromiso y hay un activismo, ¿cierto? Ya, eh, yo, eh, en lo particular, y aquí termino, es que eh, diríamos que dejé, dejé de lado, digamos, lo que como yo llegué a Erika, ¿cierto?, como profesional de la antropología, y finalmente me, me, me convertí así, eh, así, en palabras sencillas, en un activista, ¿ya? Así que, y es lo que hoy día hago, y es lo que hoy día eh, creo que lo voy a desarrollar mientras pueda, ¿cierto? Mientras, mientras podamos como la comunidad seguir trabajando. Entonces creo que, ¿cierto?, es, es eso, y... Mmm, no es posible hacer una, una diferencia tajante entre educación y activismo. Creo que están muy, 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 muy ligadas. Uh, ok, voy a traducir. El film es um, uh, is, is definitivamente un tool para cambiar y que puede ser percibido hoy como eso. Um, but it is too soon for us to be able to determine that because the film is so recent. Um, they realized that they were not able to exhibit the film um, uh, as um, broadly as they would have liked because of COVID, because of the pandemic. They wanted to show the film to the entire community um, and to um, divide the screenings of the film in different segments by neighborhoods, uh, or by sectors, uh, but the pandemic just made uh, that project um, uh, impossible. Uh, they uh, would like to be able to do that um, uh, in the future so that the people that have been affected and that have become protagonists um, in the film have the ability to watch it and to comment uh, on the film. Uh, the next uh, few months uh, will uh, tell us uh, whether that can be accomplished. Uh, what possibility in terms of goals can be um, gleaned in terms of whether it is educational or activist or both? It, it's difficult to judge in part because education and activism are very much uh, processes that go hand in hand. It's not easy to define the other one as differentiating, uh, differentiated from the other. Uh, in his case, in my case, uh, uh, they have merged uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, because I have become more active um, in this process. Um, the proper way of analyzing uh, the problem in the community, uh, I believe, is, is, is because the film is able to encompass a process. Um, and this is, makes it different from other types of films because it takes into account 15 or 16 years or more of, of, of people's lives and it's able to compress and synthesize um, all of those life experiences into just over a hundred minutes um, of film. And for this, I have to credit uh, Lars and, and, and the filmmakers uh, for their ability, which in some ways is more objective than mine because I am invested in the community in a different way uh, uh, to uh, create that kind of um, uh, effective uh, narrative. Uh, I have a different position. I'm in the community, I live in the community, I'm part of the community and, and cannot be, um, have kind of the same uh, relationship because um, you know the film transmits a process that shows the history of the community and, um, and, and it has been uh, able to do this um, uh, in a very effective way. Um, 
Uh, I arrived in Arica uh, uh, as an anthropologist, and then I have become an activist and will continue uh, uh, to do this, um, and we'll see where the film uh, takes us after that. Thank you. Um, that Wonderful to hear your responses to that. And Brenda, I think you had a question in the chat. Do you want to ask that? Uh, yes, um, uh, Lars, uh, you have this extraordinary relationship in this documentary, right? As the filmmaker and also as the subject of the lens. And um, I'm wondering how, if you could share your um, personal history and how it relates and shaped um, your inspiration to become a filmmaker. Um, and how it shaped this documentary. And it's amazing, great work, thank you. Now you can hear me. Yes, great. Um, yes, Brenda, as you pointed out, um, I have quite a, a unique uh, role in this film, uh, both as a filmmaker and uh, as a person who was adopted from Chile as a baby. I came to Sweden to live with uh, my Swedish family uh, and a father who actually both grew up in and later on came to work for, for a couple of years, or for many years actually, uh, at the Boolean company. So, I mean, this film and this project and me being a filmmaker, uh, which I still don't really feel comfortable in saying that I am because I <laughs> actually work full time at the hospital here and where I live as a speech and language pathologist. <laughs> um, but I mean, of course, the, the connection between uh, both me and Williams, because William also went to preschool in Bolin, um, was something that, that we uh, had to use uh, in the film. And I mean, of course, I, I uh, with my background, I uh, many times thought that I could be the one on the other side uh receiving these toxic wastes from from sweden uh i think i always kept that like in the back of my head in, in some way and that it uh has meant a great deal uh of course uh, my background uh our way because i say our way uh because we've always been the two of us making this film, although I'm the one in front of the camera. Uh, array of storytelling has always been this, uh, this more like personal, uh, this personal angle uh, towards filmmaking. We're not uh, journalists per se, and maybe that's why. <laughs> um, but, uh, I, I think and I hope that this way of, of communicating is as effective as we think it is because I, I when I self, uh, when I see documentaries myself, I always feel like when when the director has uh, a personal that personal like angle with the film I can I think it's mo much more easy to connect. Um, and we have, I mean, in, in the film, you also get to know uh, Rolf Svedberg. Uh, if you have seen the film, you'll know, who is the former environmental director of, of Bullion, who was a main protagonist in the first film, Toxic Playground. And that also uh, boils down to, to a very personal level and uh, how how people, how, how, how a personal decision of personal choices can have very, very big uh, effects on people's lives. Um, yeah, I, I, sorry, I don't know if I answered your question, but uh, yeah. Thank you, that was really wonderful. Um, 
I, I'm going to just bring in um, the other panelists now so that they can join in a larger conversation. I do see a chat, uh, uh, some questions coming up in the chat, but we'll come back to them in a moment. Um, so, um, you know, I'd love to bring Abby Kinshi, Professor Abby Kin Kinshi and Professor Sebastian Urita into the conversation to, to talk about the relationship as to with this film and this location in Chile and also why we are here presenting it in Troy because we have this unique overlap of all of these things through the Our Soil project. So maybe I'll pass it over to Abby to introduce herself and then um, to Sebastian after that. That'd be great, thank you. Sure, thanks. Um, thanks everyone. It's such an honor to be on this panel with all of you. Um, so I am a sociologist and so is Sebastian and both of us have been working for, well, at least the last decade on um, you know, the effects of the mining and oil and gas industries on the communities where they're located. And through that work, we, um, I guess over various meetings, you know, various conferences, um, came up with this idea that in many communities, um, some easy to use tools might be really helpful for detecting pollution in the environment, um, particularly when governments are not doing testing or not sharing the results of testing with the people who live in the community. So Sebastian had this idea that maybe we could uh, put together some kind of project um, that would involve people living in polluted communities in testing the soil that surrounds them. And so he can talk a little bit, well, he can talk as much as he wants about how he's been working uh, with a team there about uh, uh, to this Nuestro Suelos team to um, develop a really amazing set of tools. And then together we decided, well, what if we expanded on that work to, um, uh, to think about this, think about the kinds of pollution, the contamination that people experience in communities all around the world. And that actually brought us right close to home, right here in Troy, New York, where I live and where the sanctuary and nature lab are located. And while we don't have a um, mining industry right here, um, and as far as I know, no one has dumped smelter waste, um, like many cities in the United States, we have pervasive um, lead and arsenic pollution in our soil, um, particularly lead is an issue because of decades of burning leaded gasoline in our cars, of our very old buildings that are chipping um, lead-based paint, um, the demolitions of buildings that contained uh, contaminants. And so we are sort of all living in this, in this polluted environment and many of you, of course, know that, you know, know of cases of lead poisoning due to um, kids chewing on chipping paint or, of course, catastrophes like the Flint water crisis. But most of us don't pay a whole lot of attention to soil in our lives in the ways that it may also be a pathway for exposure. But the case of Arika shows us that soil or earth, right, all this material that's been brought up from the earth is um, can be very contaminated with, with materials, with heavy metals that are threatening to human life. So um, we wanted to, uh, so what we're doing is we're working on a pretty big interdisciplinary team with, with uh, scientists from different um, fields to um, uh, develop a, a kit of pretty easy to use and low cost tools for um, thinking about soil and our environment, the ways it may be contaminated, the ways it can be remediated and made more beneficial for all of us, safer to be around. And I'm just gonna for one second share my screen because I wanna share some information about um, if you are interested in this kind of thing. Um, this summer, we are going to be training, we're well, selecting and training um, people to be soil justice fellows here in Troy. So if you live in Troy, if you're here on this call, and this is something that interests you and you'd like to spend a little bit of time getting trained. Um, this, these are paid um, short-term positions um, and you'll learn a lot of things about sampling soil and also thinking about our history and our community and the ways that we can work together. So I'm just gonna leave that up for a second um, and then uh, that's all I'm gonna say about the project now. I'm happy to take questions. 
Sebastian, I'm sure has can fill in all the things I forgot to say. <laughs> Thank you, Abby. Uh, hello to all, to all. I'm very happy to be here. I'm Sebastian Leta. I'm a associate professor at the at Universidad de Tortado here in Santiago, Chile. And my, my, my approach to the sort of my very short story with the, with, with the case is that on like three years, no, like, like four years ago, more or less, I, I started uh, like, like following the, especially the, the case that, that the neighbors in Arica were presenting in Sweden. We, 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 we had the opportunity to, to run like a joint research project here, in, here and in Sweden with a, with a colleague there in which we, we follow more or less the, the procedures of the, of, the, of the case. And also, as, as Rodrigo said, my, 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 also my approach was academic at the very beginning. It was, I was very interested in, in terms of a sort of kind of knowledge production that, ha that happened in the kind of, of trials and the, and the different barriers that, 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 that people phase to move like like in a transnational level claims for the foreign environmental justice but but but, but also uh, at the time I, I was i was also studying uh, this research project that that, 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 in, that that was mostly involved or trying to develop like this uh, new or very sort of uh, affordable methodology to to assess uh, pollution on soils because because in, in another project that I, i've been following the the sort of the the last 10 years of very, very bad and very, very, very like poor implementation in Chile of the first regulation regarding soil pollution. And, and I tried to sort of to present an alternative or try to think about an alternative in a way. And, and, and in a way that the, the two, these two projects uh, uh, sort of uh, joined into, into this particular initiative in which we are trying to, what we are thinking about, we are still in the process of, of thinking about how we can use this kind of very affordable, uh, tools for measuring pollution in the case of Arica, and 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 and, and, and we are still like, like in the in the sort of trying to find out which kind of, of approach would be would be better to the to the issue. Um, I think in a, in a way we 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 know that that the, that the issue in Arica is much more larger than anything that we could do. So 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 we we, we try to be very very careful about. We're trying not to not to not to like um, generate a lot of like, expectations on the on the on the network on, on the neighbors there, and trying to be like very humble in a way in, in our approach. We know that citizen science is a, has a lot of uh, potentiality in, in this kind of cases. It can be used, but it also has a lot of uh, weaknesses. It has a lot of of, of contentious issues. So so so, so more or less what what what. what what our overall question, our, our overall approach is how we can use sort of this um, uh, tool from citizen science in order to give something for the neighbors to in which they can use to improve their, at least to, 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 to try to, to deal in a, in a better way, you could say, with, with, with the issue of the constant pollution. So, so, so more or less what, what we would like to do, uh, at least in the, in the first stage, is that in, in November, October, November, December, we, we, well, with the pandemic, everything is so difficult to, to, to arrange. But, but, but by the end of the year, we're going to, to run a first workshop in Arica, trying to, to, to teach, uh, to, to join with people there, to try to, to, to make them, sort of to show them the methodology, trying to, to work with them in relation with, 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 with one, with one particular like area, something like this, but also it's a, it's like the first stage of, of something larger, and, uh, and this is this is something like a, for us like an open question, and we are very happy to discuss it with with, with all the people who is here, with all the people who who might be interested, because I think that uh, our our hope in a way that it, it's that the citizen science initiative can do something about about the well-being of work in Arica, but we still have to be very careful about which kind of things uh, citizen science can do because otherwise it could be even worse to, to, than to do nothing. So we are very happy to be here and we are happy that this conversation is a of very few conversation with a lot of different people. Thank you. And I know the, the kit that you developed, Sebastian, with the, with the team in, in, uh, the, in Chile was really looking at uh, uh, arsenic and, and um, or, or other heavy metals, um, but we're 
as far as I understand the team here, we're trying to develop it also for lead, processing for lead in the soil. So it's kind of a, a tool that keeps evolving, which is really beautiful. Um, can you can you describe exactly what the kit looks like? Because I think that's one of the beauties of it. <laughs> the, yeah, the I, size and part and you know ability to ca to cart it around quite easily. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I don't have a. I, I'm still in here. I don't have a, like, like an image here because it's very it, 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 it's very nice. But but, but mostly the kit the, the kit is like it's based on, on chemical reactions and and, and the people. Has to bring their their own soil samples, uh, and in the workshop we work with them for them to produce the data that the, the data about, about different like qualitative concentrations of the of different heavy metals. The, the, the important thing for for my for my perspective is, is that is that the kit is not only a tool for for obtaining knowledge or for, for obtaining data, but it's most important as a kit uh, as a, as a, as, a, as a tool for empowering people. This is for me the most important thing. It's, it's the issue that people who start using these kind of kits, the people who has who have no 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 knowledge whatsoever or previous experience with with, with measuring uh, soil pollutants, they they see it different afterwards. And, they, uh, and this is this is our main goal. I would say is that the people who engage with the kit uh, use the kit to start seeing different days of days of pollution and days of science in a way and, and say it's, hey, science is not something that is practiced by the, by, by these guys from Santiago who, who, who can who come here from time to time with, with white coats or something like this but science is something that we can use and science is some science is something that we can use to move forward our claims for justice something uh, science is something that we can use to improve our, our our daily lives and something like this. This is our main aim, and, 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 and would be like very very happy if we can, in, in a way, try to materialize it in a bit. Thank you. And Abby, do you want to add anything to that? I mean, I think that the Nature Lab is uh, kind of the culmination of exactly the kinds of things that you just mentioned, Sebastian, in terms of this. Uh, hope to really empower people to, to become engaged in this way through citizen science and looking at their own environments and giving people those tools. And Abby, you've been so great at pulling this team together and pushing this project through here. Um, we wouldn't be working on it with Nature Lab if it weren't for your efforts in fundraising and organizing, et cetera. So I don't know if you have anything you want to add about the citizen science aspect of it. Sure. Well, I'll just say that one of our you know, one of the goals of uh, empowering people with tools to detect contaminants in the environment is to prevent exposures, right? So one of the problems that we have, even in, in places where some kinds of remediation efforts have been made, is that we don't always know how well they're working, right? So we saw from the film that the, you know, the, the, all the contaminated waste was, is buried now in a new location. So it seems to me a bit mysterious how much of that waste is coming to the surface, how much is still being blown around in dust and landing in people's, uh, the fronts of their homes and the places where children play. Um, and so being able to take samples and, and test um, at least can give us a picture of where contamination might still exist and then enable us to start thinking together in a real, you know, aid approach to think about how do we protect each other from being exposed? What resources can we pull together to make sure that we're reducing our chances of exposure, whether it's further covering up places that are contaminated or organizing for more legal and political action? There's a whole range of activities that we can start thinking about practically engaging in once we have more knowledge of where we might actually be at risk. So that's what that's you know one of the things that we're really hoping to do in both Troy and Erika and other places that this this project might travel. Thank you. That's really fantastic. Um, I we are getting some amazing questions in the chat, and so I just want to um, go to the, some of them, and thank you um, for those comments on on our the our soil project. It's really incredible to get it hear it being talked about in this much larger context. Um, so Danielle, you, you had a, a question that you, do you want to ask it yourself? And then you can translate, uh, that'd be wonderful. Sure. Um, uh, I, I have a question that I uh, want to address to Rodrigo and, and to the directors. Um, 
Uh, Rodrigo, una pregunta que tengo para ti, para los directores del film, uh, la voy a hacer en inglés y en español y después traduzco cuando me toque el turno. Um, and, and it has to do with, with the fact that the, one of the uh, revelations in the film is that our uh, legal uh, frameworks in, in Sweden as well as in Chile are inadequate um, in, in addressing the social justice component uh, of, of, of these um, uh of of these projects um and and so um i heard from uh william i think that an amendment has been proposed in sweden uh to try to modify some of uh, the legal uh frameworks that that are obstacles but also as we know chile is going to be going to a, a new constitutional assembly process and and there uh, are a lot of expectations about how the environment um, is going to uh, 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 feature and in the new um, charter. Uh, uh, so I wanted to know what you think, uh, you know, how legal frameworks and, and changes in those frameworks can open the door to uh, more effective litigation. And, and as a result, also to um, better protection of, of the environment and, and better acknowledgement of human rights. Rodrigo, tiene que ver con, con, con la constitución en Chile, el, el proceso constituyente que se está viviendo mm -hmm. y la esperanza uh, que hay de que ese nuevo capítulo político en, en tu país per, abra la puerta para un, un marco legal jurídico que permita uh, uh, filtrar de una manera más justa estas realidades de abuso. Uh, entonces, la pregunta es sobre si se puede vislumbrar ¿no? um, algún tipo de cambio con respecto a, a, a la Asamblea Constituyente y a las ideas que están surgiendo respecto de que el, el medio ambiente y los derechos ambientales jueguen un papel más protagónico uh, en, en ese sentido. And so I, I don't know who's going to... Uh, Maybe I can just uh, just a short uh, uh, to start uh, uh, because um, I think I was not too clear about the the, the amendment part because uh, that is actually not uh, a Swedish law but an international uh, thing from from on UN level uh, and uh, the ban amendment uh, it came in uh, came into place actually in 1985. It came into place right after the shipments from Boliden, and, and many people think that that might have been one of the reasons why Boliden was in a hurry to, to, to get this waste away. Because, of course, being one of the largest uh, companies in the mining industry, they, they, they know what kind of legislations are, are coming up. But still, when the ban amendment came, uh, many people were frustrated because uh, you could still send toxic waste from rich countries to poor countries if the receiving politicians find that it's okay. Uh, and now there is this amendment and it has come into place and I think it's 23 countries or something like that that have written uh, that they have ac accepted this amendment. And one of the things that, that it um, regulates, well, one of the big problems that, that this amendment hopefully can help with a little bit is, uh, for example, uh, countries exporting e-waste, uh, which ends up uh, someplace with, with uh, people manually going through and taking out the metals and getting it into, into their bodies. So it's sort of the same, the same kind of toxic colonialistic uh, tradition. Um, so, so just to make, so that is actually not something that is uh, especially for Swedish, Swedish law. And when it comes to Swedish law, um, uh, I think one of the, the, the big discussions in Sweden now will be about uh, how this could be time barred. Uh, I'm, because, because and, and I, I mean, these discussions are so important for us to have. 
the, the, the way in Chile uh, is that it, the, the time bar, the, the clock starts from when people know that they are sick. And in Sweden, it's from when the, the harmful act was done, sort of the crime was done, which means that, that you can see in the film, if you have done something and nobody complains for 10 years, then you're off the hook. Uh, and the consequence will also be that there will be, like in this case, we, there were children in this case, uh, and their possibility to act was time barred even before they were born, which is absurd, of course. So, I mean, this is the things we need to, to discuss and tweak and uh, in order for our legal systems to be working. Uh, Rodrigo, una respuesta breve, si te parece, para, porque tienen varias preguntas ya en, en la lista. A ver, um, a ver, una, una constitución, ¿cierto? Todo lo entendemos que, que es o debe ser, una, es un acuerdo social, ¿cierto? Y, y nosotros, desde, desde nuestra independencia, nunca hemos tenido esa posibilidad, nunca, nunca, el pueblo ha, ha elaborado una propuesta, ¿cierto?, de un contrato o de una cuarta social. Eso es uno. La constitución que hoy día nos rige y que se instauró en el tiempo de la, de la tiranía de, de Pinochet, eh, rige hasta hoy día, a pesar de modificaciones. Entonces, eh, este proceso que, que en Chile ya se inició a, hace ya par de años, ¿cierto?, no solamente con el levantamiento social, pero venía ya esa, esa necesidad de, de un acuerdo. Hoy día, hoy día, los temas ambientales, los temas de justicia, de derechos humanos están en la mesa. ¿ya? No podemos ir a adelantar cómo se, cómo se va a llevar este proceso constituyente, porque es, es primera vez ¿cierto? que tenemos esta posibilidad. Así que en esa complejidad eh, hay que entender que hoy día, hoy día, eh, no podría suceder, no, no podría suceder, ¿cierto?, lo que nos pasó el año 80 respecto del ingreso de estos tóxicos y desechos de, de Suecia. Eso no podría ser, ¿cierto?, eh, por muchos factores, pero creo que eh, esta constitución, la que se va a escribir, ¿cierto?, eh, va a poner muy, muy en énfasis los derechos, los derechos de las personas, los derechos humanos, lo, lo, los derechos incluso de representación que, que tiene el medio ambiente. Cosas que en, en la constitución, digamos que hoy día todavía no nos rige, eh, eso está muy ausente. ¿ya? Así que básicamente eso. En okay. uh, Rodrigo's answer, he says that the constitution is, is really a, a social contract and this is the first opportunity that the people have the ability to participate in elaborating uh, the social contract. And, and so uh, the dictatorship's uh, constitution still rules. It has been amended, but it is the charter that, that, that still frames uh, political life in Chile today. And, and so the new process uh, uh, is going to create a new agreement and, and environmental and social justice and environmental justice topics are going to be at the center. Uh, of the conversations. And so what happened in the 1980s uh, uh, with, with, with the arsenic and, and, and the uh, toxics that were um, exported to uh, Chile will not happen again. And, and the hope is that, uh, uh, you know, these loops and these realities can be controlled with the new constitution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Branda, I think you had a question too. Maybe you want to talk about Anna's question. Oh, sure. sure. Thanks. Um, uh, hi. Um, well, I'm going to um, integrate actually um, a question that we were hoping to go to uh, for the ending with um, Anna's question in the chat. Um, as Abby and Sebastian discussed, we're really excited about hosting um, the community Our Soil workshops at the Sanct Sanctuary for Independent Media in North Central Troy. There are so many parallels between Eureka and Troy. Um, they're both environmental justice zones with disenfranchised communities, historically with no voice. Um, uh, in our location, um, there's toxic air, toxic soil, toxic water, 
We're one mile directly across the Hudson from a um, toxic waste incinerator um, that's located right next to a playground and housing project that's, um, and that's owned by an international corporation, Tradleby. And so linking to Anna's question, at the end of the movie, when the community receives the second defeat in the ruling, soon shows a lot of determination and push to keep fighting. Do you think there is still this energy or are community members divided between those who just gave up and those who keep fighting and all those in between? How are you going to keep the motivation to fight up? And also, as we move to the end of this session, how can we build a bridge between Arika and Troy and communities across the world to keep the motivation rising and to strengthen the struggle? Lars, can you start? I mean, uh, how do you keep the motivation to fight up? You keep motivated and, and how can we build together? Uh, I would actually like to pass the question on to Rodrigo because I think uh, the, the, the answer should come from the, the community itself. That's Thank fine. Daniel, will you translate uh, the question? Uh, Rodrigo, la, la pregunta uh, uh, se la hicieron a Lars, pero Lars piensa que tú deberías contestarla como alguien que viene de la comunidad y que ha estado más, uh, digamos, presente en, en toda esta historia. Y tiene que ver con el final del documental, que al final del documental hay una sensación de, de, de haber perdido, pero que al mismo tiempo esa experiencia uh, resalta un deseo de seguir luchando. Uh, un deseo de entender que esta lucha es, es crucial y, y, y la pregunta es cómo hacer que estas luchas se hagan transnacionales, cómo conectar a Troy, Nueva York, con Arica, Chile y, y, y cómo fortalecer ese sentimiento de que esa lucha vale la pena, de que hay que seguirla, pero que hay que construir uh, uh, cadenas de, de conexión. Um... A ver, lo, lo primero es que eh, nosotros nunca, nunca eh, pensamos que, que el juicio, ganar o perder el juicio, iba a terminar eh, el, lo que era la problemática, ¿ya? Ese es un punto, que ganar o perder el juicio nosotros íbamos a seguir porque eh, acá hay, hay muchos temas hoy día sin resolver, ¿ya? La, el juicio solamente abarcó a casi 800 personas, de un total de, de miles, más de 15.000, entonces ese es un punto, ya que la película, eh, ¿cierto?, que, que se ve, que toma que, si bien, evidentemente quedamos tristes porque no, no accedimos a la justicia, que es un concepto hoy día a, a discutir y a construir, pero esto iba a continuar, ¿cierto? Y así ha continuado, eso es uno, ¿ya? Segundo, eh, la, esto de la posibilidad de poder, poder construir, ¿cierto? Un puente entre diferentes espacios, culturas y, y creencias, la película lo, lo ha mostrado, en este proceso, eh, Lord, Billian y Andreas... ¿cierto? fueron capaces de conectarse con, con, con una problemática en Arica. Entonces, se ha construido un espacio de, de difusión, de divulgación, eh, de, un, de un problema que, que también alcanza y sufre muchas comunidades en el mundo, no solamente Arica. ¿ya? Este es un, es, es un estudio de caso. Entonces, eso ya eso comenzó en su momento, en el 2005, hacia adelante, Claro, a través de, 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 de documentales y películas. Después ha seguido en procesos, en, en, ¿cierto? Dentro de tribunales suecos. Y eh, si tomamos la propuesta que, que, que nos hace, ¿cierto? Sebastián y, y Abby, respecto de, de cómo democratizar la ciencia, el conocimiento. Entonces, eh, uno lo ve y, y, y es claro, es, está, ¿cierto? Está servida, como uno dice, la mesa en el fondo, de la, de la importancia de, de conformar grupos ¿cierto? de trabajo hoy día en el mundo es sumamente rápido, esta misma conexión ¿cierto? lo muestra. 
eh, donde diferentes eh, tipos de conocimientos, diferentes, ¿cierto? De, los, eh, los conocimientos de las comunidades, los conocimientos, ¿cierto?, de ciertas disciplinas, los conocimientos que pueden aportar, ¿cierto?, del mundo de, de las películas, del de de, de lenguaje audiovisual, es posible, ¿cierto?, y, y, y se ha hecho así, es posible, ¿cierto?, hacer esa conexión, y claro, lo vamos a concretar eh, en el caso de Sebastián y Abby, en, en talleres que, que buscan de cómo la ciencia, ¿cierto?, puede y debe aterrizar y bajar, ¿cierto?, al, al, al mundo de, de la gente que normalmente no tenemos acceso al, al conocimiento científico. Entonces, ya está, no es algo así que, que sea futuro, eso ya lo estamos viendo, ¿cierto? No, no, no es cierto, solo que eh, algo que, que nos faltaba, sí, eso sí, eh, yo debo, digamos, ser bien honesto, nos faltaba esta propuesta que, que, que nos están haciendo de poder eh, involucrar al mundo científico, a academia, ¿cierto?, con la comunidad en un proyecto este de, de testear acá el medio ambiente, lo, en, en metales pesados, eso es, eso es nuevo para nosotros. Ojalá lo hubiéramos tenido hace muchos años atrás, cuando justamente teníamos nosotros una información donde aplicamos encuestas de salud a través de un estudio, eso fue el 2005, que se llamó la epidemiología popular, Levantamos información, la enfermedad de las, digamos, de las comunidades, pero no teníamos cómo testear el medio ambiente. Entonces, eso hoy día lo vamos a poder hacer, ¿cierto? Y sumado a otro tipo de información que hoy día estamos levantando. Así que yo creo que el puente ya está, está hecho. Um, uh, Rodrigo has a couple of uh, points to um, make. The first one has to do with, uh, with uh, uh, the fact that, um, yes, at the end of the documentary, people were um, sad about the results, about the, um, the, the reality of, 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 of not getting uh, the kind of justice that they sought, but they were not really um, focused on winning or losing as much as they were focusing on, uh, uh, focusing on uh, acknowledging uh, a reality that would have not changed regardless of the outcome in many ways. This is, uh, you know, there are many issues pertaining to the community's history that transcend in, in many ways the, the decision uh, by the courts. Uh, the second point that he wanted to make is that um, constructing bridges between different peoples transnationally, that the film shows it already with Lars and William already coming from a different country, different, um, even though uh, Lars has a connection to Chile, uh, as well, they, they uh, bridged different uh, realities, um, uh, making the film already kind of exemplary of this transnational solidarity um, uh, that the question asked about. More important, um, uh, it evokes, uh, particularly with the proposal coming from Sebastian and Abby of democratizing uh, knowledge and finding more horizontal uh, structures of sharing uh, knowledge, uh, that that uh, also uh, highlights this kind of transnational solidarity uh, movement. And, and then third, that this particular event, the screening also exemplifies this, this sort of interconnectedness uh, uh that what they were missing as a community was you know the proposal that comes from uh, sebastian and abby in bringing this uh kind of uh, uh structure of kids uh marrying ac the academia with the community and bringing uh, together different knowledges to produce a different understanding uh, of reality um, and so one example was this uh, project of popular epidemiology that he mm. uh, uh, referred to in which the community is empowered uh, to uh, exercise uh, 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 authority with respect to understanding their own history. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Abby and, or, or Sebastian, did either of you want to respond at all? Or Lars, if you want to jump in? Thank you. Well, uh, I think that the, the, uh, uh, Rodrigo's answers were, were, were very clear from my uh, on my side, so so I I, I just say mm -hmm. nothing more. <laughs> I would I would just like to add that uh, more or less a comment to Rodrigo's comment that it's. Um, 
as a filmmaker, uh, it's, it's very, very rewarding to see this kind of interaction taking place and be part of it. I mean, seeing I'm um, here in Norway, we're in Sweden, you guys over there in the US and Chile. I mean, just bringing it all together in this way and in a way that can actually help not only the community in Narika, but with your kit, uh, Abby and Sebastian. I mean, the po possibilities are, are more or less endless uh, as I see it. And I, I really hope that this can all uh, come together and that uh, the communities in Troy and Narika can uh, be the uh, be a start of something uh, big and I think the I mean in Chile we know there are many many cases like like this uh, where the, the kit and the experiences from what you're doing now can be very very useful also in light of the new constitution so it's just so rewarding to to, to, to I, I want to thank you also <laughs> it's so rewarding to, to be part of this of this process uh, Lars Tú le puedes decir eso en español. <risa> a ver. Por favor. A ver. <risa> My Spanish is so poor now. I've been there for so long. Rodrigo, más que nada era decir que es muy como tan, tan bueno ver que estas conexiones que están, se están haciendo ahora entre Arica, Troy. <coughs> Eh, Suecia, eh, como, como un documentalista, ver que esto está pasando ahora y ser parte de este proceso es como magnífico. Yo creo que también eh, el proyecto, es, ese proyecto de, de Avi y Sebastián tiene un, eh, mucha, ¿cómo se llama? Eh, ah. Yeah, it's very powerful, I would say. Uh, muy, muy importante, ¿cierto? Yeah. Uh, y solo que... I'm very confused mixing languages now, sorry. <laughs> You're very good. You know so many languages. It's impressive. Um, just thank you so much. Those were just incredibly kind and moving words. And I really appreciate it. I'm so glad we had the chance to connect here today. It's really amazing. Thank you. I, I, I likewise agree. That was a beautiful place to wrap up this event with those words. Thanks, Lars. Those were really moving. And thank you all for being here. This has been an incredible panel. And I, I hate to end it, but we're trying to be respectful of our Zoom time because we know everybody's a little Zoomed out um, these days. But um, thank you, especially to the panelists, because you all were just brilliant. And it's such an amazing connection to make, as Lars said. And we hope to continue it. And we wish you the best of luck when you finally get to really be out with the film in the way that you want to be out there post COVID. And, um, and it's such an important film as well as the other work that is going on on the ground with everything. So thank you all. And um, I'm just gonna close out. Well, first let's give a round of applause for everybody. Maybe you can, you know, if you wanna show yourselves and yeah, okay, those work too. So yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Really wonderful conversation, which could, as I said, clearly go on. Um, we have a couple of upcoming events I wanna mention at the sanctuary. We're in the middle of, this is part of, as Branda said, the North Troy um, Environmental Justice Film Festival. And we have events coming up, including Echoes from Lock One, a beautiful film made by um, local youth from Troy. And that's coming uh, also part of this environmental film festival. And then a beautiful piece called Witness to the Future, which is by our dear Brand Miller. It's a 25th anniversary of this incredibly important film, Tracking Toxins in the US and the, fact, the ways that that has developed uh, cancer has led to the development of cancer in many people's lives. So Brando will be speaking about that film coming up. We also are opening our lab, Nature Lab, the, the DIY bio lab, community lab part of it. And we'll be having an event at the end of May. Please join us as we break open our community lab to the community. Go to mediasanctuary.org. If you can spare some extra, extra funds please think, consider being a sustainer for the sanctuary. And if you want to volunteer anytime locally, we always can use the help 
either finishing nature lab building or other a million other events. So thank you so much, everybody for coming. Thank you to the panelists. Really, really wonderful event. And we hope to see you all again soon. And thanks to our tech team. Have a great day. <laughs>